Hello, my name is Don Young Park, and I'm an assistant clinical professor for the UCLA Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I'm also the vice chair of quality and safety for the department and a member of the UCLA Comprehensive Spine Center. Minimally invasive spine surgery is a commonplace surgery in the field today. And minimally invasive spine surgery has been shown to be effective and quite safe with the premise that there are smaller incisions that lead to less soft tissue injury and can have improved healing and faster recovery from surgery. Traditional open surgery is associated with larger incisions, more soft tissue injury, and this is due to detachment and damage of the paraspinal muscles that then can lead to atrophy of the muscles, greater blood loss, and increased pain and disability. The principles of minimally invasive spine surgery is to reduce the soft tissue and muscle injury, minimize bony resection, minimize bleeding, and reduce pain and disability after surgery, yet still target the specific pathology causing the symptoms. This way, we can then optimize patient outcomes from surgery. And you can see here that the incisions are quite small, smaller than a quarter, and the soft tissue damage is much less. When you look at the MRI on the bottom left, which is associated with the traditional open approach, and the MRI on the bottom right, which is associated with minimally invasive spine surgery from less muscle injury. Or in orthopedic surgery, we've been using uh, arthroscopy as a means for, to perform minimally invasive surgery. And we can perform this in many joints in the body, including joints in the hand, elbow, shoulder, hip, knee, and ankle. And it's quite commonplace and very widely accepted throughout the world. Endoscopic spine surgery can be seen as the arthroscopy of the spine. And this is more commonly accepted and practiced in Asia and Europe, but not so much in the United States. You can see minimally invasive spine surgery as an evolution over time, where you go from larger incisions to smaller incisions. We have many open techniques with expandable retractors and larger incisions from these techniques to tubular retractors and fixed tubes and incisions that are smaller and even percutaneous techniques with the endoscope. A common pathology that spine surgeons see um, and perform surgery on is lumbar disc herniation. And we uh, have quite successful surgical treatments for this, including uh, microdiscectomy, where we can use the microscope for illumination and magnification and uh, use microscopic tools and instruments to perform the surgery. We were able to use tubes to be able to uh, visualize and see the anatomy and our incision length is typically 18 to 20 millimeters in length, which is still quite small. Now, with the endoscope, we can visualize through two to three millimeter incisions and use specialized endoscopic tools and instruments to perform the same kind of surgery. Now, what does the evidence show for endoscopic discectomy as compared to microdiscectomy? There are uh, prospective randomized trials and studies that show that there are similar improvements in pain and function at two years follow-up, and that the microdiscectomy is associated with greater back pain immediately after surgery, but this tends to equalize over time, and that endoscopic patients have less complications, less pain medication requirements, and associated with less disability with the endoscopic surgery. Another surgery demonstrated improved leg pain with endoscopic discectomy. However, these studies tend to be small in number as well as just the experiences of the surgeons who uh, perform these kinds of surgeries commonly. When you take the uh, studies all together and combine the results, the meta-analysis of the literature shows equivalent and sometimes superior patient reported outcomes. The hospital stay is even shorter than microdiscectomy, whereas you know, microdiscectomy uh, uh, patients are able to go home the same day with no difference in reoperation recurrence, or complications. When you compare the results of endoscopic uh, surgery in this study uh, with the SPORT trial, which is our landmark study that showed the effectiveness of lumbar microdiscectomy, we find that the reoperation rates are lower. However, the reherniation rates are higher in endoscopic technique. And that might be because the uh, endoscopic technique reduces visualization and you're more likely to retain fragments of the disc uh, as compared to the microdiscectomy technique. However, the overall complication rate is lower. Another common pathology that is treated with uh, uh, 
spine surgery is lumbar stenosis. And the traditional technique was the open laminectomy, which has been shown in multiple studies to be safe and cost-effective, as well as superior to non-surgical treatment in the long term. When we apply the laminectomy to the minimally invasive technique, which is a technique that I use very commonly in my practice, this uh, surgery is called the unilateral laminotomy bilateral decompression, and it has similar patient outcomes overall as compared to open techniques with shorter hospital stay, less blood loss, and less pain medication requirements. And there's improvement in function uh, with this minimally invasive technique with low complication rates. And you can see with the MRIs on the bottom that the uh, stenosis and compression of the nerves are, are relieved by the surgery and the nerves are well decompressed with this minimally invasive technique. The endoscopic technique does the same surgery with smaller incisions using smaller tubes to be able to introduce the endoscope, yet still perform the same surgery. You can see on the MRI on the far left that the uh, uh, nerves are quite compressed from ligaments that are thickened, a facet cyst that uh, is compressing the nerves as well as overgrowth of the bones of the spine. And after endoscopic surgery, the MRI on the right shows significant decompression and opening of the nerves uh, so that they're uh, uh, well uh, decompressed there. And the endoscope can visualize it quite nicely in terms of how well the nerves are decompressed there. The studies show that there's significant improvement in pain and function with endoscopic technique, as well as improvement in stenosis that is significant. There's more back pain associated with the minimally invasive technique as compared to the endoscopic technique. However, in the long run, at one year follow-up, there's no difference in pain and function. There are lower complication rates, uh, especially with dural tears and infections, and that may be due to the smaller incision size with the lower rates of infection. When you take all of the studies uh, that are small in number, as well as low in evidence and quality, uh, then the results show that there are significant improvements in back and leg pain, as well as disability, with similar results in the long term with open and minimally invasive techniques. However, the endoscopic technique takes longer to perform for the surgeons. It takes longer to master for the surgeons. And so uh, this can affect the outcomes for the patients overall. What about other applications? There are surgeons who are using this technique for cervical spine and thoracic spine pathologies, as well as performing endoscopic lumbar fusion. However, there is low quality of evidence and small numbers of these studies, and therefore it is still investigational. So what are the downsides? The downsides are that endoscopic spine surgery may not be uh, uh, approved and covered by all insurance plans or carriers because it's experimental and investigational. The Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, says that the percutaneous endoscopic discectomy is considered investigational as a technique. Um, and some carriers like Cigna recognize single level lumbar endoscopic discectomy, but none of the other types of surgery like cervical and thoracic endoscopic surgery, including other percutaneous decompression type procedures that are out in the market. And so this shifts the financial burden of the surgery to the patient and they will be responsible to uh, cover all of the costs for the surgery themselves. Another downside is that the uh, cost of the endoscopic in instruments is quite high for the hospitals uh, and surgery centers, and the cost of the endoscope, radio frequency generator, monitor, and disposable equipment for each one of these surgeries uh, would be uh, then placed onto the hospital and the surgery center, and this can contribute to the increasing healthcare costs that are associated in the United States. And as we know, these costs are rising exponentially. In terms of uh, other downsides from the surgeon's perspective is that there's reduced visualization with the endoscope and we are limited by what the endoscope can uh, show us. And so if, if we're not uh, used to using the endoscope, then we'd be limiting ourselves uh, and perhaps even uh, not completing the surgery to its fullest. It, we would have longer surgical times, which then is increased anesthesia and perhaps even increased risk to the patient. 
There's increased risk for complications, especially during the learning curve, as surgeons are trying to get better and better at this. And this can lead to continued pain and symptoms from incomplete decompression or residual disc herniations that can occur in the future. The studies have shown that there's no added long-term benefit for uh, endoscopic surgery as compared to minimum invasive techniques, other than perhaps reducing the uh, immediate back pain after surgery, but this does get better over time. And the, the, the difference in uh, incision size may truly be more cosmetic than functional. And as my, one of my mentors has always said, it's not the size of the incision that matters, but what you do underneath. Uh, you really need to take care of the pathology at hand so you can best take care of the patient and their symptoms. So is endoscopic spine surgery the next frontier? Yes, I believe so, and, but in select cases and in select patients. And we are very early in our experience here in the United States, and so we will be going through a learning curve, and the surgeons will be getting better and better at this as time goes on. However, I do remember this similar controversy with minimally invasive spine surgery 10 to 15 years ago, when traditional uh, open technique uh, was a dogma at the time. And uh, the similar arguments were made against minimally invasive spine surgery in terms of the learning curve, in terms of the possible complications and risks. And now it is more commonplace and accepted within uh, the field of spine surgery. But we do need to justify the downsides, which is the cost. And so we need to be able to explain the cost of the implants, of the equipment, and perhaps over time it would equalize as more and more of these surgeries are performed by more surgeons. And we have to be able to get through the learning curve um, uh, with surgeons without compromising the effectiveness of the surgery and the safety for patients. Thank you very much.